underwriting deals is such a major pain point for people. Most don't want to do it, and the people that are good at it are few and far between. That is why after six years of being in the industry and buying over 1,200 apartments, using my best-selling multifamily deal analyzer, I created Real Estate Lab, a full suite acquisition software for multifamily investors. We have built a product that helps investors automate their acquisitions and close more deals all in a cloud-based platform. You can go to realestatelab.com and sign up today using the promo code TAG2 for 10% off your first 12 months. This is David Tupin. Thanks for listening. Welcome to The Apartment Gurus, where twice a week, host Tate Seymour brings you deep dive interviews with the wisest gurus in the apartment investing industry. These experts are sure to create game-changing value and inspiration designed to catapult your business to the next level. Be sure to reach out to Tate at www.investwithgreenlight.com for access to his investor portal and Calendly link. And now, here is Tate Seymour and the Apartment Gurus. Welcome everybody back to another episode of the Apartment Gurus podcast. Really excited to have a guru on the show by the name of George Klein. George is coming to us from just north of Denver, Colorado, which is in the same time zone that I'm in here in Salt Lake City and uh, and another Intermountain West investor. And uh, he is a uh, he is an owner operator. Um, he's he's a co GP in over 1,100 units, and he's the lead GP, the lead general partner is what GP stands for, in over 600 units. Um, and he's got another two deals in the works here uh, that he's working on closing before the end of the year. So he and his partner uh, started working together in 2020. So it's it's been a uh, you know a two year ride here. Sounds like you guys have gotten some great stuff done, George, in the in that two year period. Uh, and you, like us, have taken on asset management now as a primary focus. As you know, and yeah. and listeners, what you'll find is that you know you work really hard to get the deal, uh, you know, fund the deal, do your due diligence on the deal, and uh, get it to the finish line. And then that's where the hard work begins uh, with yeah. with managing the asset, managing the property manager. So I'm uh, really looking forward to talking to you about that, George. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, just really excited to have you on the show. Welcome. Great. Glad to be here myself. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's great to have you. Um, and I, I will just go ahead and, uh, and and mention George's family as nine children aged oh, yeah. 10 months to 28 years old. So you are a true family man. Yeah. And, um, and strangely enough, you don't hear any of them in the background right now. We'll see how that goes <laughs> for the rest of the time. <laughs> yeah. 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 You, you and I have a lot in common, but that's something we don't have in common. I'm, I, yeah. I have exactly zero children zero, Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and have never been married, never been in that position, uh, you know, in my 49 years of existing on the planet, uh, not out of, not out necessarily out of planning that it that way. It just kind of has happened that way. And, I'm very open to any and all possibilities moving forward, but, um, you know, it's, uh, I can't imagine the rewards that uh, in the, re the rewarding aspects of, of having a family like yours and, and seeing everybody grow and achieve and do great things with their lives. Yeah, you know, it, it is, it's fun. It's uh, it seems like that's what most people know about me or hear about me first is just the number of kids I have, just cause that's, it's a little unique, you know, this, yeah. this age but uh yeah. you know this is uh labor day weekend and yeah. it's just monday we had all but one of the kids over who lives in a different city now and and my parents too so it was oh, just wow. a house full it was fun and it was it was chaotic just like it always is and i think that that's just kind of how it goes um having this this large of a family it's like no it's not orderly ever <laughs> <laughs> it's just yeah. how best can you manage the chaos um, yeah. But I'd say, you know, for being an entrepreneur, especially doing apartments, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. well, keep stuff together. It right. never goes exactly as planned. And how well are you going to roll the punches? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, like you say, there's a lot of moving parts in the multifamily venture, you know, when you're investing in, in apartments and, uh, 
Well, and a lot of those come in, in the asset management, uh, you know, space after yeah. the, after the deal has been acquired, but, you know, even in the deal acquisition part, uh, when it comes to, you know, you and I were talking before we started recording about a couple of deals that one, well, two deals you're working on one that we're working on. And, and, you know, we, we just, like you said, it's just after Labor Day, uh, 2022, it's September 6th. And we've just been through four or five months of rapid shifts and, and, yeah. you know, huge, huge changing trends in the market. Um, and that's made getting these deals done really tricky. And like you say, it's kind of like managed chaos. Has that kind of been the, your experience with them? Oh yeah. Yeah. So we did, you know, as you mentioned, I was, a uh, before we ever led our own deal, I was a co GP, which I always recommend people do go, go help raise money and help with all the other things you can do as a co GP to learn before you ever go try your own. Because honestly, you know, being an entrepreneur for so many years, like like most people in this space, they have some of that self-starter and they also have this uh, idea of I can do it myself, learn what I yeah. need to, know that I need people. As other podcast people have said multiple times, is this is a team sport, yeah. um, but you just don't know what you don't know and getting to shadow these other people and help out with, hey, send this out, go find this and then talk with investors was so helpful in figuring out what this was going to be like and yet it still didn't prepare me enough mm-hmm. for what our first deal was. We closed on our first deal that we led just coming up on a year ago. It was the end of September. I, if I can go off on this for a minute, I, I say that syndication or buying apartments, it's really like having kids. Maybe it's because I can make most things into like having kids. Since <laughs> that's what I have the most experience in of anything. But yeah. It's like most gurus out there, you know, the, the, the paid coaches, they teach you how to find a deal. Right. You know, that's, that's, that's the majority of what they teach you to do. Right. Um, everybody I've seen is that some of them do it better than others. Um, and that's really the best part in some sense, at least for me, I'd yeah. say that that's like, that's kind of like getting pregnant, you know, mm-hmm. some family, <laughs> uh, they, they have a hard time with that. And, and it, yeah. it's, I, I have good friends. I've heard stories where it's like, they can't get pregnant, can't get pregnant. They finally give up, they go adopt and immediately get pregnant. There's some mindset or something that has to be changed. And I don't know, but there's definitely a lot of things that equate with that, that you're working on thinking, this is the job. I've got to figure out how to do this. And you're working and touring. I think we toured. Well, I know we underwrote very deeply, at least 150 deals before we got the one that we did. Uh, we toured probably 20 to 25 places. Um, so, I mean, a lot of miles, a lot of time with brokers, burned a lot of bridges just because we didn't know what we were doing. We sounded stupid. Um, and I think we just got grace from a few of them as well. Mm. Uh, but so that's, that's like the getting pregnant part. And what everybody focuses on is that. But it's like that's the fun part and that's the easy part once once you understand it. And then then there's this, this middle period. Maybe you want to call it the due diligence. It's from the time you sign that PSA until you close. And I say that that's like when you're pregnant. Mm-hmm. And you're excited because you just found out you're pregnant and you're like, we're going to have a kid, an apartment, and everything's going to be great. I'm, I actually am a real apartment syndicator. And then you start throwing up the next morning and then you start gaining weight and growing hair in places you didn't know was possible. You know, all these weird changes happen. And then on top of it, the doctors are constantly looking at you going, huh, yeah, you're probably too old to be doing this. You're probably going to die and the baby's going to die too. So sorry about all that. Wow. So that's, yeah. that's what closing is like, trying to get to that table, you know, uh, investors falling out or banks changing their terms or all of a sudden your rate caps three times as much as it was the day before. There's so many hurdles to get over it to me and, and then just constant morning sickness. Um, that's, that's the hardest part to me. But then, as you mentioned, this asset management, we decided to keep that in-house. It wasn't our original plan, but we decided to keep that in-house. Uh, Andrew, my business partner and I, um, we run Ardent Equity Group. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've been doing that, like I said, for uh, got together at the end of 2020. And we didn't think originally we were going to do asset management. But what we realized is who else knows this deal like we know the deal? Yeah. Who loves the deal like we ha- like uh, know the deal or love the deal? And that's, again, why it's like it's like you're finally birthed this baby. What are you going to do with it? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, hey, you said you didn't have any kids. But honestly, it's a very strange thing in, in, in America where you have the baby and they go, yeah, you got to stay here overnight. Okay, great. 
next day they wheel you out, hand you the baby and say, good luck. And I always joke yeah. with my kids about not being a great parent that they don't give you a test before they let you be a parent. They just let you be a parent. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's kind of like. It's like all of a sudden I've got this apartment building. It's like, well, what are we going to do with it? And But we devised a business plan. We had hired the, the property management company. We knew what needed to happen. And we thought, well, we're the ones that are going to be the most vested in this deal. So let's stick with it. And mm -hmm. uh, because we're both full time, we had the ability to do so. Um, and what I say with that is apartments are kind of like kids. They're resilient. You, you can drop them on their head. You don't want to do it very often, but they're going to be okay more often than not, as long as you're giving them some attention and intention. You have a plan. You do your best, but you've got to know how to roll with the punches. Things change from your yeah. business. What are you going to do? Absolutely. So, yeah, so we've really enjoyed the asset management piece. We've gotten some new tools um, and learned a lot along the way. And our deals are, are running great right now. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to say that's only because we're awesome. Um, but also uh, just we picked good markets when we were doing underwriting. We picked good deals and, and they just happened to do well. And then our asset management has uh, hopefully helped just continue that out with renovation plans and, and rent increases. So, so, you know, just to take your analogy a little further, yeah. because look, listeners, like, Asset management is 100% where the rubber meets the road. You you can you can buy a great deal. You can do a terrific job on due diligence, know everything there is to know about the deal. And you can even hire a great property manager. And if you don't asset manage well, which asset management really kind of to simplify is, is like managing the manager, right? Like you're working really closely with the property manager on achieving the objectives of the business plan and if if you don't get that piece right like you might as well not do the deal because sure. you're you're likely to either not make money possibly lose money like you know you, you, and then you have a complete mess on your hands with huge vacancies and huge delinquencies and everything else and 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 you're not getting you know most most deals or a lot of deals that that you're going to see are value add deals, right? Where you, you're going yeah. in and you're improving the property. So in addition to managing the, the property manager, you're likely also going to be managing construction manager or the property manager is going to be managing the construction manager. And here again, like that piece has to, has to be gotten right uh, or things aren't going to go well for you. And so I'm really glad to hear George that yeah. you're, properties are going so well and that you guys are so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that last part. Yeah, it's been good. We've done well. Uh, you know, we're part of a, you know, a, an investor group, you know, a, a coaching program and, yep. and they're just great. I could go on a lot about how awesome that's been. But one of the main things is just, they've been that far ahead of us, right? And so like when we were looking at these markets, we said, who do you know, who do you recommend as property managers? And that's that's been a big thing is we've, we have two different um, main markets that we're in and the two different property managers, it's, it's too far apart, they don't do the same areas. And mm -hmm. they've been great and that's that's been a huge part. So that's given us a lot of grace as we're trying to figure out what we're doing. Yeah. You know, how do we actually implement this? And, you know, with the spreadsheet, it's like things all work out. But, you know, when in the real world, as you said, when the rubber meets the road, we've got to turn that spreadsheet into actually what type of countertops and who's installing it and for how much and when can they actually get in there and do a good job. You know, that, that's a that's a different story. And so uh, having a great property manager is obviously the, the first step in that. And we were able to get some trusted one that our group had had quite a bit of traction with. So that that's also helped out, not just the us being awesome people. So, yeah. Well, yeah. that's first and foremost, but getting the property manager right is is a big deal too. <laughs> it is. Yeah. And, and and look, like a lot of people that have been listening to the show for a while and and kind of know Greenlight's story, we got the property management piece wrong in uh, oh. one of our tar one of our two target markets. We hired them to manage three properties for us, and uh, and it, it was the wrong choice. And I won't get into to all the hows and whys that, that, uh, we weren't very well served by them. Um, but it was very painful, very, very painful. And, uh, divorces are messy and, and, uh, this was a messy divorce, uh, professionally speaking. And, and there were, you know, there were legalities and termination fees and just all kinds of messy, uh -huh. messy stuff. Um, so, you know, a little side note to your listener, you want to have your property management agreement, your contract with your property management, 
you want to have that thoroughly reviewed by an attorney uh, before you sign it. And a lot of times you think, well, this is a reputable property manager. I'm sure that they do contracts all day, every day. I'm sure this is fair. And the reality is that there are undoubtedly going to be things in there that at the very least you should know about and be prepared for. Uh, and, and at, you know, in worst case, you might want to have changed or edited or, uh, amended somehow. Um, so, you know, a little side note for takeaway for listeners there. Um, so what markets are you in George, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah. Yeah. So our first place was in Warner Robins, Georgia. And, you know, yeah. I was, when the broker called us about that, we're like, Who, who's that? He's like, no, no, it's aware. <laughs> Um, we'd not heard of it. We were looking in, into Georgia and around Atlanta, like a lot of people, just because, you know, it's just, I, I love Atlanta. Um, not necessarily the humidity, but I like the numbers, what's happening in that area. Yeah. Um, so we, Andrew and I focused when we first started, I think there might've been just kind of little limitations in our brain. We're like, listen, we, we're not going to go into Phoenix and Orlando and Denver and say, Hey, here we are brand new. We're going to, you know, compete against the big boys. Plus, in those markets, from my limited knowledge, there's not a lot. People are willing to take a lot less returns on those deals yes. Yes. than our investor base was. And so it's like, that's not the place for us. So I wanted to look for uh, an overlooked market. And so we had our criteria, and I was uh, just going through all these criteria, and I would just... <laughs> uh, my oldest son, uh, he's 28, and he's helped me out in a lot of my business do, uh, dealings over the last maybe decade and a half. Um, at, gosh, I guess since he was 16. So, yeah, a little decade and a half there. Wow, yeah. Uh, and so I, I was showing him some of this stuff right as I was getting into it, uh, you know, getting into multifamily syndication. And I was, he's like, so how do you pick a market? Because that's what I was trying to do. And I said, well, I've got all these criteria. So I just literally think of a city off the top of my head. And then I go see how it does on all the markets. And I write down in the spreadsheet what I find out. Mm -hmm. His response is, why don't you just do them all at once? And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, let me show you. So just in a matter of time, he just set up this thing to, to scrape all the different sites. I got him a list of the top thousand most populous cities in America. He says, let's just run this. And then we created a spreadsheet there right then and there that had all these criteria from multiple websites to look at all these different cities that I'd never even heard of um, and then how they set with these with hmm. these indicators. So when the guy said Warner Robbins, I'm like, and you know, once we found out it was a place, we got off the phone and I looked it up and I was like, wait a minute, this this looks pretty good. Yeah. So um, so yeah, we're in Warner Robbins, Georgia. Um, I said we closed that last September, and uh, something that was fun is uh, uh, my business partner Andrew. He was down at Dealmaker Live. That's Michael Blanc's group. I was there too. Yeah. Oh, you were okay. Yeah. yeah if you remember, yeah. there was a guy. I cannot remember his name, uh, but I think he was showing an axiometric data for the top 10 rent growth cities in the country. And then it said not including Florida, which I thought was a nice little disclaimer. And and he called special attention. He goes, yeah, look at number eight, Warner Robbins. I'm sure none of you ever even heard of that place. And we're like, we own 270 units down there. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so our, our, our newest deal that we're trying to close on this month uh, is for another 190 units down in Warner Robbins. So we love Warner Robbins, the whole middle Georgia area. Yeah. Um, we have another one up in uh, Shambly, Georgia, which I'd never heard of, but it's kind of like kind of like the new Buckhead. It's just growing. I think it was at 300 and some percent population growth in the last few years. Holy cow! That's, yeah, that sounds un unreasonable, but it started very small. That's still a lot, but you know, I think yeah. it was you know in the, under a hundred thousand. All of a sudden, it just blew up. So, yeah. um, so we love Shambly, Georgia. That one's been doing great. And then we also uh, this one I almost don't want to say because. I guess it's not too hidden, but Northwest Arkansas. Love yep. Northwest Arkansas. Yep. That's uh, yep. Bentonville, Springdale, Rogers, uh, Fayetteville. All those right there. It's over 550,000 people in the MSA, but yet you don't ever feel like you're in a big town or a big yeah. city. You can just drive from one place to the other. Uh, we, we love it up there. That's Walmart's headquarters is up there. Yep. Tyson Chicken, lots of other uh, great outdoors. Plus the Waltons are just dumping dumping money in the area, attracting yeah. new people. Uh, you got University of Arkansas up there. So we yeah. love that. And we have yeah. 256 units up there too. So nice. those are kind of the main areas where we are right now. Is that 256? Is that one community? It is. Yeah. Everything else we bought, uh, 
it's portfolios and underwriting portfolios is a real pain in the butt because you got to take all these multiple documents. So this one, we're like, oh, it's just one property. Nope, it was built in two phases and they were running it as two properties. So we still had twice as much work to do. Um, yeah, it's a 2008 build, 128 units, mm. uh, 2008 build. And then they have land in the back um, and they built another 128 units that they finished in 2021 that we. Oh, owned. wow. Now we're just one, running it as one property, one address. It's all, you know, you, one place you pull in off the main street. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you got, okay. So your first couple deals, the Warner Robbins deal uh, uh -huh. was 270. That was a, that was a portfolio. Was that, um, yeah. is that, were they single families, multifamilies? How, how did that work? So single family or multifamily? Well, I mean the units themselves, the 270 units, it was a portfolio. So oh, yeah. what were the... It was a t portfolio of two apartment buildings. Oh, okay. I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So like one was, I don't, I don't remember, 180 and one was yeah. whatever the other number is. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So those, okay. they, were, they were two larger properties, both of them over 100. Um, and we like that, like I think most syndicators do, is because if you go under 100 units, it's hard to to justify paying an on-site on staff. That's right. Know, management and, and, uh, and repairs. Yeah. Yeah. It's fleeting me right now. So yeah. uh, that's why we like the hundred units and up and both, both properties were over a hundred units there. Yeah. And there's, there's a few other reasons to like a hundred units and up in my opinion uh, as well. Yeah. One is that that's the, that's the ocean that the brokers swim in. And if you're, if you're taking this business very seriously and you're, and you're looking to, you know, make a major impact and own a lot of units, you want to double down and triple down on your broker relations program and your, uh, you, you know, your, 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 your reaching out to brokers, you're, uh, constantly interacting with brokers. And ideally those brokers are bringing you deals, but they're not calling on the 30 units and the 40 units and the 12 units. And they're, they're, they're networking with and calling on the bigger asset. Uh, class with, you know, 80 plus hundred plus units. And that's, those are the deals that you need to be prepared to do when your phone rings and a broker calls you and, you know, not to, not to go too much deeper into this particular aspect, but equity is different in that space. Um, wow. When you're raising yeah. capital, yeah. you know, you know, yeah. you, you have yeah. access to capital sources that if you if you have a five million dollar equity need or or ten million dollar equity need, there are a lot of sources that will write checks that size, but will not write a two million dollar equity check or three million dollar equity check. So, um, again, I don't want to deep dive too much into that, but it in some ways, you know, you hear people say it's actually easier to raise capital for the bigger deals. That's what they're referring to. Now, whether or not that claim is actually true is. Uh, for debate, but, uh, you know, as George, you and I were talking before the recording, like that whole world has gotten pretty chaotic and as well. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, but, um, I love that you guys went right away for these bigger assets. I think that's super exciting. It's, you know, I coach people in this space and, and a lot of times I'll run into somebody who, is like, you know, I, I really want to start with like maybe a 10 to a 30 unit, something like that. And it's really a matter of when you, when you kind of dive into that conversation, you realize that that's really a product of that person's limiting beliefs around what they know to be possible for themselves. And there's this natural tendency to want to start small and work your way up. And there's a lot to be said for that. I just had Brian Burke on the show and, and he was somebody that started with uh, hundreds and hundreds of single families. And then eventually he had such, such an investor base that he just naturally evolved into the multifamily space. And he strongly advises people to, to start small. Um, and, and there's, you know, so there's different schools of thoughts about, of thought about that. My whole point is if, if it's equal playing ground between the two, why not go big? Right. Cause scale is your friend. If you're getting the, th the major pieces, right. The, your business plan, your asset management, like all that stuff is, you know, your, your gains and your appreciation and your rent growth is amplified many, many, many times when you go for a bigger asset. Have you, have you found that to be true? Oh, absolutely. And, it, and it's strange because 
you know, uh, having my own business for so long, you know, I'd like to say I was a business owner for, you know, decades since 1994 was my first one. And it's like, yeah, but I was really just a, a sole proprietor. You know, I was a gun for hire. And so I did, I did run a couple smaller businesses, but for the most part it was, they were hiring me, right? Mm -hmm. A contractor in a sense. So I bring that up to say that's different than a business owner where it's like, I'm not going to do everything myself. I'm going to find the right people. And um, I've noticed as I've gone to different uh, events, um, different syndication, investing events, real estate events, and I start talking with people, networking, and you hear that and people, and especially even before I got a place, so I was just trying to learn as much as I could. People would hear what the guys had to say on stage and they're like, yeah, I think I want to do the 12 to 20 unit. And the reasoning was, is they thought they could just do it themselves. Mm, they said, yep. you know, and I, and I get that because when it's just you, you only have to worry about you. Right? Right, right. You know, and you have more control, at least you think you do. Um, but I know that uh, I mentioned my business partner, Andrew Moore. Finding him was uh, was accident and a huge blessing. It ended up being we're very alike in many ways, but we're also very different in others. And so we have some complementary skill sets and character traits and and perceptions and observational areas. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things I can really point to a couple different times in the last few years where he has pointed out limiting beliefs I had had. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of my first multifamily events I went to was Rod Cleef. Yep. And it's like Rod, if you know Rod or what he does, a lot of it is on uh, – Rod even calls himself like a, a Tony Robbins wannabe. That's probably a little mm -hmm. rude, but I think it was something <laughs> like that. Yeah. He loves Tony Robbins. I, and and I, I heard this from so many people and I had the same reaction. Yeah, 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 let's get to the meat. I don't need to worry about my mindset. And going into this, I thought that was the case. But Andrew, having a partner, was able to see where I was stopping something just because I thought, well, that's not possible because I myself don't know how to do that. Yeah. Um, he turned me on to a book that I haven't finished reading by love, but it's called Who Not How. Who Not How. Yep. You read that? So good. So good. Yeah. And I always forget the author's name. Um, do you remember? Uh, Sol Dan Sullivan, I think. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that's correct. Yeah. yeah. But that's like, that's the idea, is, is especially in this in in multifamily. It's not you're not supposed to do it all by yourself. There's other nope. people. Your time can be spent somewhere else with the skills you have. Hire somebody else. I I, I think of that with uh, you mentioned the contracts. I, yeah. I'm kind of a detail oriented guy, but not to the point where I want to read a 30 page contract with a right. bunch of legal stuff. It's like that's interesting for a few moments, but then it's like, wait, what? Solely this person expressly? Like I, I don't know what's happening. Um, you know, you need a good team. You need a good lawyer that you trust that knows what's going on and can look at that and go, yeah, this is standard, not a problem. Or say, hey, this section was is too heavy, um, heavy handed for the, the other person, the other party. And so having the, the right people on your team is a huge piece. And yeah. without that partnership, I wouldn't have had that. And Andrew was able to point out some things that I was thinking smaller. He's like, let's let's go big. There's mm -hmm. no reason that we can't do that. And and time and our effort proved proved him right mm -hmm. and uh, i even remember is after we got our second one under contract because even after we got our first one under contract he was like see you're real you can start telling people this is what you do for a living i'm like nah that could have just been lucky uh, right. <laughs> i can really be a an eeyore at times um and and, it, and so i remembered uh it was after we got the second one under contract and we got the psa sign he looks at me he's like so are you a real syndicator finally? Kind of like <laughs> why now, you know, yeah. that Pinocchio comment. And uh, it's like, yeah, you're right. This is something we do. We yeah. are going to continue to do it. We enjoy it. We've got it. We don't know everything, but we know how to get people uh, to come in. But to your question, I guess, um, about the smaller sizes, you know, one of the deals we're trying to close right now, um, a little bit further out, not much, but uh, is is only 64 units. Yeah. And there's some special uh circumstances surrounding it, the why we even took that. Uh, know the seller for one thing. And it was like, oh, this will this won't be any problem. I mean, look at these hundreds of units we've done. I think we'll have like 800, 900 units by the end of the year on track for that. And it's like 64 units, not a problem. Oh man, it's been way harder. Mm -hmm. and, you know, as, as you said, that was one of the things that surprised me. I guess I knew it, but um, rather than coming back with this difficult, uh, you know, debt time, you know, the debt markets, yeah. Yeah. rather than having, you know, 10 to 15, uh, pieces to go well which one of these deals do we like which one of these uh, loans do we like it's like we had one yeah said, yeah. yeah only one was interested because it's under five million dollars we're like what right and, and the and it didn't work it's like the, the interest rate was too high the uh, leverage was too low 
it's like, well, how, what are we going to do to make this deal work? And we still haven't given up on it. We still have some creativity that we're trying to throw at this to see because I still love the deal. It's in Little Rock, and I think Little Rock's a great market as well. Yeah. So, but yeah, that those those smaller ones, and then and then to your point, after all this is done, if you look at it, I know we're not just doing this for the money, but that definitely is a big piece of why we do what we do. Yeah. It's like it's just as hard as doing the 150 unit, and we're yeah. going to make half the money. Yeah. Yeah, so, exactly. So why would I spend my time on that? So yeah, we're learning every step of the way when we, you know, with the small one, I don't know that we'll do more small ones like this. Yeah. Yeah. We did a 43 unit this year and, you know, same sorts of reasons. We knew the seller, we had a, it was an off market deal. It was a brand new building. Uh, it was class a, you know, rents were high uh, or, and, and rents had room to grow and it, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Um, so by no means do I, uh, or George, do we, um, you know, discourage doing smaller unit counts, but I, I would make those the exception, at least for us, um, rather than the rule. So, yeah. Um, yeah. If there was a good reason or something about it that, you know, is hard to quantify on a spreadsheet or something. It's like, yeah, maybe, maybe so. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, something you just said kind of, it just, it just kind of popped an obvious question into my head. Um, you said something along the lines of, you know, you're not just doing this for the money that that is a part of it, but uh, it's not all of it. Are you pretty in touch with your big why your the reason why you do what you do? Not really. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's hey, yeah. I appreciate that honesty yeah. so much. I really do. Yeah. You yeah. know, my, my business partner, Andrew, uh, he's just a phenomenal guy. I can't wait for you to talk with him, too. Uh, yeah. He, is a Marine. And then he became a missionary for three years. It's like, what, what a dichotomy. It's like, bam, you know, and, and his, his experience in life and his character, um, there's just so much to say. Um, but he's, he said, why, why are you doing this? And my first answer is I have nine kids. <laughs> you know, my business was more or less shut down that I've been doing for t- over 20 years when, when the lockdowns happen, it's like, yeah. well, cause I need to make some money. He's like, well, yeah. that's not strong enough. I'm like, it's strong enough for me. You know, and, we, and I, I kind of got a little pissy with him about it one time. Um, but he, luckily he was patient with me and I've realized it's like, you know what? Yeah, it is the money. But once the money starts coming in, it's like, well, why, why, why am I actually doing this? And I've realized it's like, no, there were some other underlying issues, like, like being able to help people out. Like my dad is invested in, you know, almost all my deals, my mother-in-law, good family friend. Those are just some of the people I know that have invested alongside of me. They were, they were some of my first investors. They trusted, you know, what I had researched and, it's like, well, I want these deals to do good for them. And my dad was, yeah. uh, I'm not going to go into the whole story now, but that's really how I got started. Uh, he had had a heart attack and uh, five, had to have a five-way bypass. He died on the table, came back to life, wow. you know. And, uh, and I remember sitting down with him. He had been a pastor for over 40 years, small church, 200 and some people. You know, wow. just local, you know, not not a pastor like with the TV shows and making big bucks right. or anything right. like that. He just had a, a meager li- living and... Uh, spent his life helping other people. And now here he is, you know, he, I think he was probably 74 at the time, 75. It's like, mm-hmm. dad, if you had died, what's going to happen to mom? And, and same thing I go, or worse, you're going to be alive for another 15 years. What's going to happen to the rest to both of you. Yeah, and right. uh, we had to take his small retirement and, and, and find a way to do something with it. And mm-hmm. so I started on this trek of trying to find the best way. And I knew real estate was the way to do it. And we ended up at multifamily. And so it's like, one of our deals that I co GP'd on is just just selling. It's supposed to close the end of December. And you know, things change every day, but it looks like he might triple his investment. Nice. And, yeah, in, nice. in under, just under two years. Wow. I'm looking, I'm looking at my dad, I go, Dad, I go, Do you understand what this is? I said, You're not gonna have to worry about money anymore. Yeah. You know? yeah. Not that he's gonna live high on the hog, buy a yacht, brand new cars, nothing. I was like, Right. He still has other investments. Maybe those will come in and he can get a few of those. Maybe not yachts, but new cars, vacations. But it's like you can now not have to just worry where's the next check going to come from? What's going to happen now? He still does uh, some some mission work and mission training and he lives off donations. And that's – I think it's a great way to see, you know, the to see how God and, and my dad's faith that they hold up. And, you know, every, every year he just looks back and, wow, I've made it again. But I was like now this is going to be there. Yeah. You can now do what you need to do without worrying about is the money going to be there too. Yeah. So beautiful. I, I think that's a big why for me is I really do like helping people with this. And um, mm. that changed my mind in raising capital too. It's like, I'm not trying to sell anything to anybody. Mm. 
we've yep. got a great opportunity. And if you don't see it, then that's fine. I'll help you see it if you want to. But it's like, where else are you going to put your money where it's it's right. safe? Like this? It's right. going to get some good returns. And if, if the world crumbles tomorrow, you know, war or mass death or all the things that are told to us every day in the news, it's like, still, this is probably the best place for your money. Yeah. People need a place to live. Yeah. They need a place to live. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Universal need and people pay for their place to live before they pay for anything else just about. Um, So yeah, I mean, we've talked about this before, but in, in typical downturns or black swan events, like you're talking about the multifamily asset class space performs remarkably well and is historically very, uh, Unvolatile is that the word? Involatile. Resilient. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, resilient and yeah. stable. Like yeah, exactly. yeah, like not subject to the volatility that stocks are that like office spaces, like retail space, like you know, other different real estate asset classes. This multifamily space is remarkably low on the volatility scale. Oh yeah, you know yeah. It- what, however you feel about Trump one way or the other, it seems like there's nobody in the middle about Trump, but however you feel about Trump, he's given me a great talking point when talking with would-be investors. It's like, they're like, well, you know, I have my money in the stocks. I'm like, you want to put your money where some guy can wake up and tweet 120 some characters and drop <laughs> them out of your investment right. or, or lift it up. It's like, is that really how you want to have your retirement? Yeah, you know? that's a good so, point. Good yeah. point. I, I want to ask you about... Um, well, actually, I want to highlight something that I think is is very brilliant on your part, and that was uh, your plan and your execution on being a co-GP before you became your own GP, your own owner-operator. Um, for, for listeners, you know, being a co-GP typically means being a capital raiser. Uh, where you're sourcing capital yeah. and um, perhaps bringing some of your own capital to somebody else's deal that they're an owner operator of. And you as a team member are also a general partner alongside of that general partner. And guess what? You're in all the meetings, you're in all the email chains, you're in all the text chains. Yes. Like those, that's a great, great way to get into this business, learn the business from somebody who is much more experienced than you. That's going to keep you from making big mistakes. And, uh, and guess what? Raising capital guys is a huge part of this business. And typically if you're, you're either finding a deal or you're finding the dollars, those are the two GP members that get the most chunk of the GP. So man, like, I've actually, I, you know, in 140, 150 episodes of the show, uh, I've, I don't know that I've ever had anybody that did the co GP thing first and then went into, uh, w- went into being your own GP. And I think that's a brilliant, pl- uh, brilliant path. Did you, did you find that to work w- really well for you? Yeah. You know, what's so funny is we talk with, uh, we talk with a lot of people and help them get moving in this. And when people come to us and you meet again, I've just met all these network events and you go and talk to people. Everybody's like, well, I want to be a syndicator, which means that I want to be the guy who finds the deals. And I think that there's something in that, that you think it's me in a spreadsheet and me in the web and maybe a few phone calls to brokers. And then I'm going to make all this money. It's like, there's so much more to acquisitions than just that, even though there is that, but it seems like, Maybe the the least scary. A lot of people are like, I want to do something new, and but there's this limiting beliefs that hold them back. And so, like, well, that's simple. And you're like, well, you need to capital raise on a deal. And they're like, well, who's going to lend me any money? I'm like, listen, man, if you can't convince your parents and your family friends to invest alongside your money, how do you think you're going to convince a broker that you, with no experience, that they should sell you a twenty six million dollar deal? It's like it doesn't happen. I mean, maybe in some obscure place, but. I know for me, when I would call a broker before I'd ever raise, because I, I don't come from a you know good friend group of high net worth individuals. It's like we're just normal you know middle middle of the road you know income earners here, and uh, and when we would would make these calls to the brokers, 
I, I'd try to do the scripts. I'd try to say the things. I'd try to sound confident. But really, there was lacking the true confidence. And strangely, just doing my first deal, which I believe was like 160 units, the minute that, that I, I had helped raise on, the minute that closed, I remember calling a broker, a new broker, and saying, yeah, yeah, well, I'm a, I'm a co-GP. Man, this was what Andrew told He helped me come up with this. I'm a managing member on 160 units. There you go. Units, you yeah. Know? It's yeah. like that's not, that's not nothing. And that sets me apart from the guy who's done nothing. That's right. right. And, and, and what I had to do, and, and in this capital raising aspect, it is so needed, but also it helps you. It's like you've got to know how to talk about a deal. And it's better to be doing that with your friend who's going to ask you questions, whatever, and you go, uh, I don't know. And then yeah. you call the GP and get him on the Zoom, the lead GP, get him on a Zoom with you or on the phone call with you, or he just you know answers the questions and you parrot it back. That process to me, I think helps me understand how to talk about a deal because now I talk about a deal with, you know, with the bank, with, with uh, private equity or with, you know, groups of investors or other GPs. I know how to talk about a deal because I did it a lot talking yeah. with family and friends and, and not, and they're not all going to work, but that's that you really, I, I feel like you should always go through that process first, save yourself a bunch of time, do that, get on a deal, be able to say, yeah, I got 600 units under management. All yeah. of a sudden people listen to you, I think, yeah. even, even other investors. Yeah. Um, one more thing to tie that up is I raised on one deal. Andrew had raised on a deal before. We got Then we started working together. I raised on a deal. And we did some things separately. And as soon as I was done, I'm like, I did it. I finally raised on a deal. I can put this under my name. And he's like, well, what's the next one? And I'm like, well, I, I can't raise on it anymore. That's the end of the money. <laughs> right, I went right. through it. Nobody has any more money. What am I going to do? He goes, I, and again, he's like, you, you can do more than that. He helped set some things different in my mind. And within, I think, two and a half months, I raised on three more deals. And, nice. you know, almost four wow. times the amount of equity brought in. And cool. it was like, wow. And it was only just maybe a month or two after that that we got our first deal. Yeah. You know, we got it under contract. So it, it, I, I would suggest anybody that wants to do this, raise first. Yeah. Raise first. Um, you, you know, find good operators. I, I, there was a deal I raised on maybe a couple that I'm like, I don't ever want to ra- work with that team again. Not that they're horrible people. I just don't like the way they did things. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. Learn those things. So when you go to do your own deal, you'll know how to what you want to do and what you don't. It just saves you. Learn from other people's experience. And you can only get so much of that from a book or a video or a podcast. You kind of just have to do it. And to yeah. me, the capital raising is the best way to get involved in the deal. Yeah, I agree. I really do. And and I didn't always agree with that. Um, in fact, I was always a deal first kind of guy. Yeah. And uh, I definitely, you know, coming from the single family world, I had a lot of voices in my head that were saying things like, you know, if you get a good deal, the money will come or, uh-huh. you know, that, that sort of thing. And uh, like you said, George, you just really illustrated well why that doesn't happen. It's because, you know, you, you get a good deal you go out and get money from family and friends. That's great. You get the deal done, but then what? Right. And uh, so I'm curious, let me just real yeah. quickly ask you, you tapped out your family friends network, but then you went and funded three more deals. How did you go about uh, finding those investors? I, I wish I could say something, you know, uh, I built a website, got a, a funnel and right. you know, got on LinkedIn. I did a bunch of podcasts. I think all those things are great, but we've been too busy to actually do any of that. We just now launched our website, you know, two years into work. You know, okay. we finally have an active campaign funnel set up. Yep. And we have some investors coming to us that we'd never even heard of. So that's that's kind of interesting. But this was staying staying with those same family and friends. It was like, well, what else am I going to do? I've committed to raise another X amount of money for this deal. Yeah. Well, just be, making that commitment opens up possibilities. I started thinking of people I had not talked about talk to. Um, But then also some of the other people, you know, after a couple of months of this for the first asset performing, those updates going out on a monthly basis, which is hugely important as a lead GP, make sure you get your monthly updates out. That started sparking conversation amongst my family and friends. And so that, well, you know, I said no before I'm interested now and, or, Hey, I I gave you what I told you was all the money, but I actually am willing Mm -hmm. to take out more from the stocks to put it into this. So a lot Mm -hmm. of it was, was repeat business. Um, you know, having a 506B offerings, we're not allowed to generally solicit. So we don't we do not do that sort of thing. Um, mm-hmm. But there is this thing of especially, hey, I close on my first deal. Yay. You yeah. know, and so I would be able to post something like that. And I just post a picture of the place with how many units it was. And just say congrats to the team. 
Yeah. Well, and I have family and friends saying, what's that all about? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's not, Hey, here's what I'm going to do. It's, it's here's what I did. Mm-hmm. I didn't say, please contact me. You know, talk to your lawyer about how you want to write those posts. Our, our, our lawyer, Dugan Kelly with Kelly Clark, he's got some very good guidance with that. And I think he's probably on a pub, couple co- podcasts, mm-hmm. but he's like, just, just congratulate your team. Don't say anything about how to get involved or anything like that. But I had people that, you know, just a neighbor of mine say, what's that about? And I'm like, I, I told him in a five minute conversation, I, he's like, well, what's the address to, to the web address to look at the deal? And before I knew it, by the end of the day, he'd invested in two of my deals. I'm like, that was the shortest conversations I had. I was mm-hmm. like, well, do you need to know anything? He goes, he used to be a, a licensed, a, a licensed broker dealer. And mm-hmm. he's like, no, I know how to, to figure all this stuff out. I read your financials. Everything looks great. And that's why I invested in him. It's like, well, do you have any more friends like that? <laughs> right. So. Yeah, so unfortunately, there's not a lot that I can say, I, you know, go do this, go do this. Not a lot of pragmatic applications rather than commit, get in there and figure it out. Yeah. Get your stuff done. And, and that desperation will, can create, um, create new opportunities, I would say. Yeah, no doubt. That's, that's fantastic. Just using your existing investor network, getting referrals, getting, uh, yeah, you great. know, talking about what you're doing with your neighbor that like all, all, all really good stuff. I, I want to ask you too uh, before we run out of time here. Uh, you mentioned you're in a in a coaching program now. Do you mind me asking? Let's just give give somebody a plug here if you feel comfortable. Sure, uh, sure. Which one that is? Yeah, yeah. After the way I arrived at this one was was through lots of work and research because as entrepreneurs, that's what we typically do. We like to do that. Um, I'm with Think Multifamily, Mark. King, yeah, yeah. And absolutely love him. Uh, I've worked a lot in my previous life, uh, trade shows and conferences. So I was backstage, always you know doing tech support, helping the guys, the CEOs, the VPs who are getting on stage and their admins, the people that try to keep everything cushy for them. And these people would walk up on stage and be smiley and friendly. And I just can't tell you the number of high level people, high worth net worth people that then come off stage and treat their, their staff like hell, throw the crew under the, the bus, you know, just things like that. And with Mark Kenny, I, I helped him out with a, a, an event early on. Uh, trying to add some value. Um, It was in actually summer of 2020 when things looked like they might be opening back up. And we had some regulations and things we had to do differently because of, you know, fear of COVID and whatever else, you know, the government. Um, And so we had, we we were set streaming the event and the whole, right as we were about three minutes into the event, we realized his audio stream was coming, broadcasting pitch up an octave. So he sounded, he sounded like a little girl. (laughs) <laughs> if you've seen Mark, this is a, a meaty guy who works big, out. Big, tall guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He, he's a big guy. And he's talking like this. And and his, his assistant's looking at me going, is there anything we can do about this? I go, not without turning the stream off. He goes, yeah, just let it go. So afterwards, you know, at the break, I go up to talk with Mark. And, you know, I'm like, hey, sorry about this. He was so cool. He was like, yeah, all right. Yeah. And I've seen that so many times. And, and with these the debt – equity markets the way they are and deals having to retrade being able to be cool calm and collected in a yeah. in a perilous situation like i mentioned when all the doctors are saying everything's going to die um that's that was huge that i think is one of the biggest things working with mark and the second thing is we have access to mark yeah. you know I don't, I don't have a coach that i can reach to i'm not saying that those don't work but i, I could text mark right now and say are you in any or in an audi and he would text me <laughs> Uh, you know, so that that sort of access to me is what set him apart from all the other coaches and stuff that I looked at. So, yeah, that's fantastic. It's been a great time and we would not be where we were had it not been what we've done to this point with Mark. So. Oh, that's fantastic. I've met Mark and his wife. I, I want to say Janiel or uh, Tamil. Yeah. Tamil. Tamil. Yeah, you're Thank close. You. That was good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, they're they're fantastic people and just fantastic entrepreneurs. They're they've, they've made a huge impact in a lot of different ways in a very short period of time. So that's great. Well, this has been awesome. Unfortunately, we're running up against time yeah. here. Um, I just want to highlight a couple of things, um, from this, from this talk and, and for listeners, this whole concept of becoming a co-GP and a capital raiser, uh, before you do anything else is highly, highly worth considering. And George is a great example of, um, being successful through taking that route. And, uh, so George, I, I want to congratulate you on that. Um, thank you for providing such a good example. 
for for uh, listeners, for myself. Also, um, you know, you're the product of a great partnership, and you've really proven that uh, this is a team sport, and that we are better together. And in, in fact, it's darn near impossible to do this business uh, on your own as a solopreneur. Yeah. And yeah. we we see that over and over again. So, listeners, get in that mentality, right? Of of uh, the, of being a team player of figuring out what your strengths are, what your resources are, what you have in place and going out and taking the who, not how model and go get that book, by the way, if you haven't, yeah. if you haven't read it, go get that book by Dan Sullivan, who, not how, um, take that model and apply it to your business. Cause that's going to really elevate you and your game. And like my, one of my mentors, Tim Bratz, he says, uh, you know, it's better to have a slice of a watermelon than all of a grape. That's, um, that's really good. I like, yeah. I like that. Yeah. Good. yeah so, and that's, that's what we're going for here is, is lots of slices of watermelon. So, so George, man, awesome talk. This has been so good. I'm really, it. really grateful for all the value you brought and uh, you know, really rooting for you guys love to see what you guys do next. What, what, what does the future hold for you guys after these next two deals? Do you have kind of a master plan? Yeah, you know, I told you we just launched our website and we realized we've got to increase our investor base. I mean, there is a point where you do kind of run out of family and friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't always want to be saying, hey, 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 here's my next deal. It's like people know right. what I do now. If they they if they want to get involved, they know where I am. Yeah. Um, website was something we did. So that was a big piece for us starting that whole marketing piece, uh, ardentequitygroup.com. Okay. We try to get the longest domain possible. <laughs> right. right. So, um so we got that going. We are really in a time, Andrew and I have said, uh, we paused our acquisitions for a while, but we literally have thrown the brakes on our acquisitions. As I mentioned before with the metaphor, we got really good at that. Mm -hmm. uh, we enjoyed it. We had a process. We had a small staff uh, helping us vet a lot of deals. And a lot of times, we, as to your point, we had good relationships with brokers throwing us deals. And we just said, we need to recalculate. What we were doing was fine. We feel like we're at a point where we need to do something new and that doesn't mean hey we're going to go diversify into different asset classes it's just how we approach what we're doing we're spending a little bit more time back on our asset management we want to make sure that we're doing the best we can with the deals we have yeah um, so yeah. so we've been doing that and um, so just trying to, to tighten the ship up tidy it up clean it up especially as we go into the christmas season here you know at the fall uh, we want to spend a little bit more time with our families. We've been doing this full time, and man, we've been there's nothing passive about the income we've been creating yet for yeah. ourselves, at least. Yeah. So um, there's just I guess it's a, it's a it's a pivoting time for us. What are we going to be doing next? Um, how are we going to approach this? Um, so we're going to be going to a lot more events, uh, making more connections with people, uh, just to see what how we're going to approach it. You know, this idea of just syndicating a deal, we can do that. We'll probably do a few next year like that, but. But beyond that, it's hard for me to tell you. Maybe yeah. in a couple months, Andrew and I can both be on here and we'll tell you our new greatest plan. So let's do it. Let's do it. Are you going to come to the best ever conference in Salt Lake? And yes, we sure are. You were out in my neck of the woods yep. uh, for it this year. We'll yep. come out to you. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yep. absolutely. We'll be there. That's, that was a great event this last year. Well, so. if you're a skier, I'm I'm putting together a little group of uh, of skiers to either we'll either do it the day before the conference or the day after. And yeah, and uh, so will you let snowboarders come. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, I'll be there. I'd love to do that. That'd be yeah. great. Okay. We'll, we'll put you on the list, but um, well, George, thanks a ton, man. I have a lot of gratitude to you for, for coming on the show and being so generous, kind of opening Appreciate your playbook yeah. for, for the listeners and for myself. Uh, so ardentequitygroup.com, A-R-D-E-N-T equitygroup.com is the website. Uh, are, are there any other ways that a listener might want to reach out to you? Yeah, email's best. Just George okay. at ardentequitygroup.com. That works. There you go. Okay. So that way I can get to it. So George at ardentequitygroup.com. So yeah. listeners, there you go. Uh George, thanks a ton, man. I wish you all the best and and looking forward to uh meeting up in in January, if not uh before. And uh looking forward to seeing all your success down the road. Well, thanks a ton, Tate. It was yeah. Great. Listeners. Yeah. Thank you. We love you guys. We're so uh, grateful that that uh, you you come on board with us twice a week and listen to these episodes. Uh, and we're we're just trying to provide as much value as we can to elevate you and your career and your business as 
as much as possible. So keep coming back, leave a rating and review. If you feel inspired, that always helps. And, and uh, we're, like I said, we're doing two a week now. So we'll see. Yeah. Right. (laughs) We'll see you in a a few days uh, on the next episode of the apartment gurus. So take care, everybody. Thank you, George. This has been the apartment gurus with Tate Seymour. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform to contact Tate, go to www.investwithgreenlight.com for access to his investor portal and Calendly link. He loves to hear from you and thanks you for being a valued listener. Just a reminder that you are the guru. See you on the next episode of the apartment gurus.